Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Feed Your Soul brought to you by Aish. I have the most amazing guest this week. And before I bring him on, and I'm telling you, you are going to want to wait to hear from him and see him cook and hear his stories. He's a celebrated journalist and um, culinary celebrity in Israel and worldwide. Before I bring Gil on and tell you a little bit more about him, I definitely need to just address the situation at hand. First and foremost, before we went live, he said, please let there be no sirens so that we can come to you in peace and share our you know, love of food with you. And I always think that food is an incredible, universal um, um thing that brings us around the table together, that brings peace, that brings, that uh, allows for discourse. And I always think that it's just like a unifier. And so I definitely very, very much want to be able to get through this uh, broadcast. We were not able to broadcast last week um, for for that reason alone. Um, first, before I go into sort of my thoughts and feelings about where things are at right now in the world and today here in Israel, I want to hear from you. Please tell me where you're watching from. Please tell me how you're feeling, how you're doing, if you have any questions for us. Always, always, always ask your questions, type in the chat. Adam Bradley, our producer, will bring them on and we'll definitely always try to answer and get to all of your questions. So like I said, say hey, tell us where you're watching from and tell us where you're feeling, what you're feeling and how you're doing today. So to say the last 15 months have been um, unlike any other in my lifetime is an understatement. The last month has continued to get so intense here and certainly the last week, the last week or two, it's been an unbelievable um, challenge. I see here the graphic has come up and I wanna make sure that everyone here can see me. Sorry, we're just having a little, few little technical difficulties um, here today. So please excuse us, you can imagine uh, what's going on. So it's been an incredible, incredible challenge. Uh, people are always asking me to comment on the situation. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna say just because somebody has a platform, just because they have followers, it doesn't mean they should be commenting on um, the situation, political, uh, you know, current events, etc. Not everyone is always qualified nor do they want to always share their opinion on things that are going on that can be divisive or that can be a trigger for people. So I'm not going to get it all into those aspects of the current situation, only to speak about it from the position of a mother. And what I think every mother wants in this world, every parent, my next guest Bill is a parent as well, we want peace, we want safety, we want security, we want that for our children, we want that for our all the children of the world. And I think that, I think we can all come together. Hi, Chaya, tell me if you agree. I think we can all come together around that desire. Hi, Kanok in Toronto, how are you? So that's very, very much um, my goal. And I, I'm very much at peace right now, even given the current situation, even given the issues at the borders, even given the internal conflict that we have. And certainly there have been situations um, terrible in my own neighborhood, whether it's in the supermarket or whether it's on the street, whether it's with kids or women, et cetera. There, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of unrest that goes without saying. And the way that I personally deal with it is through prayer. I very, very much connect through prayer. I turn to God, formal prayer. I've said this before, informal prayer, and just say, please, God, help, help me, help me become, help me be smart, help me, um, you know, help my family stay safe, help the world stay safe. And really, what we're doing is we're just, please, like we're praying for peace here. That is what we're doing. That is the goal, and that is sort of the angle that I'm coming at you from today, here from the center of Israel. I live in the Jerusalem area. Um, don't worry, don't worry, everyone, don't worry. We can't, We worrying doesn't help anything, Ross. Um, so what we really, really need to do is to just stay strong in our faith, in our strength, and like I said, a lot of prayer. That's to me, Aviva, that's how I'm handling the situation. And hi there, watching in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you for all your prayers, and I think that that's what we need, need to do. We need to pray for each other. Hi there, Marlon in Miami, and pray for peace. I have the most unbelievable, incredible, amazing guest. Amazing. Okay, guys, I, I, I just, I want to tell you, like, I have been wanting to have Gil on forever for so long. Born in Jerusalem in 1962, and I cannot believe he gave his, you know, you know he's not a woman, he gave the, the date of his birth. Gil Hova is an Israeli author, TV personality, and restaurant critic. 
his memoir, Candies from Heaven, was recently published in English and Chinese. That is like the coolest thing ever. Talk about being translated to multiple languages. I'd love to know how Chinese became the third language after Hebrew, English, and Chinese. I'm really, really looking forward and exciting to have Gil on the show. It's been um, a desire of mine for so, so long, like I mentioned. And so as soon as we're able to, we're going to bring him on the show. I hope that I'm actually just checking my notes um, to make sure that Gil can still be brought on if there were no sirens or anything. Oh, there he is. Ah, Gil! Hello. I'm just like buying time. I'm just buying time. Chitty chatting. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm very, very, very happy to be with you, and I'm honored to be on your show, Jamie. And uh, shut up. <laughs> it's it's amazing, Gil. It's like I said, I've been wanting to have you on the show for so long. You're such a celebrated culinary journalist. You're in Israel and internationally, and so I love that you chose. We're going to do a lot of talking about your memoir, your life, your backgrounds. Um, but I definitely want to start with the cooking. I love that you chose tabbouleh. Tell me a little bit where it comes from and why you chose this recipe. Well, I chose tabbouleh because it's an interesting salad. You were talking about praying for peace. Uh, tabbouleh is about war. So it's a culinary war between Israel and Lebanon. A few years ago, our neighbors from the north, the Lebanese, mm -hmm. sued Israel in the international court in Den Haag for stealing two of their national dishes, hummus and tabbouleh. Wow. Now, this may sound a bit strange, but uh, if you're familiar with the term of appellation, so some dishes may, be, may bear a name only if they come from a certain region. So for mm. instance, a very good Chardonnay is a very good Chardonnay, but only if it comes from the region of Chablis. In France, it's a Chablis, yes. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Lebanese claim that tabbouleh is Lebanese. Therefore, we cannot market it around the world as an Israeli salad, nor can we do it with hummus. They lost because there is no appellation for, for this kind of food. There is, it's not patented. And to tell you the truth, Lebanese tabbouleh is totally different from the Israeli tabbouleh. You know that in the Middle East, the food goes from south to north. So the further up you go, the better you get. So Egypt is, huh. Israel and the Palestinian Authority are okay. Syria and Lebanon are wonderful and Turkey is the empire. So <laughs> Lebanese tabbouleh is, is wonderful. It's usually a food for women. It's consumed in the afternoon when women get together after they are done with the chores of housekeeping. Yeah. And it's a very green salad. It's a green mash of, of, of all, all the herbs you can imagine, olive oil, lemon juice, and some bulgur or some frike, which is green smoked wheat. Yes. The Israeli tabule is totally different. Shall we start making it? Yes, please. Let's cook and talk. I love listening to you, though, by the way. I could listen to you forever. <laughs> so we Israelis are very ruthless, so we do not use bulgur. <laughs> we use instant couscous. It's much nicer. Yes. And so here I have a bowl of instant couscous that I made before. It's very easy. You just put couscous and hot water in the in the bowl, and, it, and it's ready. And now we start chopping whatever is going to go into the tabbouleh. So we'll Can start. I say, Gil, one of my um, tips for instant couscous, though, is I do like to give the couscous a little bit of a massage with some olive oil in my hands first to kind of coat the grains. I feel like it makes it a little bit more fluffy and less sticky. Do you ever do anything like that? Yes, and my my tip about instant couscous is never do a food demo in, in Russia with instant couscous. Oh, okay. Because they don't know what it is. <laughs> Once I did it, and they thought that it was a kind of a kasha, a kind of a porridge, and it, it, the tabule, you don't want to know what happened. Okay, so I don't. We, we have tons of chopped dill, and I'm going to put it in the bowl, and now I'm going to take a bunch of parsley. And again, look at it. When I say a bunch in Israel, it's really a bunch. It's not just a few stems. It's a bunch. And we Israelis are like goats. Whatever is green, we eat. So <laughs> you may use whatever herbs you like. If, if you like fresh mint, if you like tarragon, if you like thyme, if you like whatever. Cilantro. Yeah, no, cilantro will come in a second. We live oh, for cilantro. Yes. Don't worry. 
Um, it's a very friendly salad. It's very accepting. So here mm-hmm. again, a big, big, big bunch I of parsley. It. And I now it. I promised you cilantro. My cilantro. You know what? I love how you keep saying we Israeli. So I became Israeli like nine and a half eight and a half years ago. And so mm-hmm. I love that you're teaching me a lot about what we Israelis like should look, feel, <laughs> and how we should eat. So it's good for me. <laughs> so not only we Israelis, we Yemenites too. You know that I'm half Yemenite by origin. So mm-hmm. we Yemenites are usually very afraid of the stems of cilantro. There is okay. even a special verb in Yemenite for plucking out the leaves and discarding of the stems. It's called le'al wow. al this is the verb. But we don't have to here because actually the stems are very nice. And as my grandmother used to say, they're good for your eyes. So oh, good. Wait, which half shocking. of you, Gil, is Yemenite and what's the other half? Uh, one half is Yemenite. That's from my dad's side. So they immigrated to Palestine by foot to the land of wow. Israel from Yemen in the mid 19th century. The other half is the Ben Yehuda side. It's uh, Lithuanian, and on the other side of that side, it's Moroccan. So I'm a canine dog. Yes, <laughs> I have everything in. Now we have wonderful tomatoes in Israel. One of the, the reasons to live in Israel is the abundance of tomatoes. I'm going to take these are quite small, so I took five, and I'm going to dice them quite. Finally, usually, you know, I think that Israeli food should be rough, and I don't like when they cut things too thin. But right. uh, I don't I like all the chiffonades, etc. I leave this to French cooking. But right. in this salad, you do want to dice the tomatoes. Well, to sort of, I'll show you. This is what it should look like. Can you see my hands? I can. Here. Like it's like a medium to small dice. It's not like yes. finely diced. No, 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 no. Well, it depends. You know, the, the the classic Israeli salad, which, you know, you can know if an Israeli is a right winger or a left winger, because it's whether we call it Israeli salad or Arab salad. So the classic okay. salad <laughs> is very finely diced. And uh-huh. it's actually a kind of an Israeli sport to dice the, the vegetables very, 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 very small. But I don't get into this sport. I'm not very good at it. No, we can't, we can't get into this craziness, Gil. There's so much going on in the world. And the bottom yeah. line is my, my nine-year-old, she makes the Israeli salad. And some weeks she's in the mood for big dice and some weeks small dice. And I'm not reading into it. I'm just letting her good. do the shopping, you know? Good, good, good. <laughs> it's a very good idea. Now, as I said, this salad is, is super, super, well, friendly or even loose, I would say. It uh-huh. accepts everything. So if, for instance, you want to add yellow to the salad, you can open just a can of corn and just, you know, uh, get rid of the liquid and add it because it's the I right have size, never right? seen corn in a tabbouleh. Like, you've seen that before? A, on my table, yes. <laughs> Wow. I'm not sure that the Lebanese are going to be very happy about they'll, this. They'll sue but... you just for that, Gil. Exactly. Okay, tomatoes <laughs> into the into the. Wait, pot. Gil, can you just shed any light? Is it true that the grape tomato was developed here in Israel? Is that rumor true? I think that yes. And what, what I like even more about this story, I'm, by the way, I'm taking a yellow bell pepper instead of corn, okay. and I'll be dicing this. What I like more is that they develop a special kind of a cherry tomato um, for Marks and Spencer. Now, this cherry tomato grows on very long vines, and every okay. day two tomatoes uh, ripen. So every day two tomatoes turn red at your home. Yes, you buy all of them green, yes. and every day one uh, two tomatoes uh, become red. And I say, it's so sad that those Brits, whom I like very much, have two (laughs) snakes a day because we buy tomatoes by the bucket. Oh, literally, yeah. So tomatoes, bell peppers, these are all vegetables that are really in abundance in Israel. And that's what's nice about Israeli cooking because they also 
not only add vitamins and you know the, uh -huh. i don't know but they add so much color and i think that this is why israeli food is having a moment right now all over the world oh my gosh. because it's so instagrammable you know yes yeah polish food russian food, they're wonderful but they're brown you can't yes, eat brown yes. food yes but yes this is you know an extravagant think about i have to tell you for us you know um who are working in Jewish food, kosher food, Israeli food. So cholent is one of the worst. Kugels, yes. one of the worst things to have to photograph. But once yes. you start to get with the salads, like a simple Israeli salad, like you said, is so Instagrammable. Ella is agreeing with us. She said beautiful colors and textures, so imaginative. I, I love that she said that. I don't know if you do this, but in our house, we can't buy enough cucumbers. We need like a U-Haul <laughs> truck to bring back the malathophonine, the cucumbers from the super every day. It's crazy. So so cucumbers and zucchini are are a bit of a problem because you know there is a, a british proverb about zucchinis that the right way to cook it is to uh wash it slice it and then uh, put vinegar and salt on it and then throw it away to the garbage because <laughs> this is what you do with this vegetable i totally could have guessed that one I, that's how i feel about zucchini do you feel different i, I you know I always say that God punishes us with the people we love most. So my partner is a zucchini fan. Oh my gosh. Not only is a zucchini fan, he also likes sushi, which I really dislike. <laughs> oh, and, you do. And, and, and uh, I even have to make fish for him and our daughter with these sacred hands. My hands are touching fish. God forbid. You know, I come from Jerusalem. We don't eat fish in Jerusalem, but... What can we do? Okay. okay. Well, you're so, not in Jerusalem no. anymore, Gil. So. No, no. I'm <laughs> in there. So this is my bowl. It's almost full, but I'm going to add some more stuff to it to make it even happier. So if we were in uh, pomegranate season, uh, yes. Yes. pomegranate yes. adds ruby color yes. and taste, etc., etc. I think that a very good substitute is dried cranberries. So Me too, but I like with the no sugar. Do you get, I exactly. get them from the sugar? Exactly. Yeah, okay, good. Sugar one is like cranberry. plastic and ugh, and the other one it's like tart and, and plump. Exactly, exactly. And if you don't have it, because again, we're already family, so I can tell you all the secrets. Yes. You can chop plums, you can chop a red apple, you can chop oh, wow. a, 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 a peach. Something that has sweetness and, and freshness, I think it's a very good addition to the salad. Toasted so, pine nuts. So, okay, yes. so tell me though, Gil, before we even add the next thing, you're, you're giving me so many options for adding. What makes this tabbouleh? Just the couscous and the herbs, and then after that we could do whatever we want? Like, I what is the, the basic? very stuff? basic is couscous, herbs, tomato, and cucumber. It's okay. Just, it, 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 it's actually a vegetable salad to which you added carbs, and carbs are life, you know, we live for empty carbs, right? So yes. it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's this, but then you can add a lot. I think the more you add, the more fun it is, the more Israeli it gets, because you know, Israel used to be a melting pot, but it's no longer a melting pot, it's a quilt. It's very colorful. It's people from 70 yeah. different ethnicities, and our talent should be the same. So here we add, Toasted pine nuts, those are tricky. Remember with pine nuts, you know, for a second you don't watch them and they burn. So yes. when you toast pine nuts, always be next to the pan. Don't answer the phone. And once it's done, turn off the pan, but get them out of the pan. Don't remember that the pan is hot, so you don't want them to burn. Now we're going to add, well, scallions, I leave out. I'm going to add lemon, and I want to show you something with the lemon. Um, whenever you cook Israeli food and you mm -hmm. use lemon, use the peel as well. The peel is very, 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 very good for you. And the taste is wonderful and it adds sunshine. And if one pit or two pits fall into the salad, just say, it's rustic, it's rustic, it's okay. Oh my so <laughs> I, I'm adding the juice of at least one lemon, at least one lemon, maybe I'll add more later. But then, look, I'm taking uh, the peel of half a lemon and I'm chopping it. Wow, I, I thought you were going to zest it. This is like no, much more rustic. 
Yes, I, I want the bitterness. I want the bitterness. Bitterness is good in moderation. Well, we're Jewish. Bitterness is always good, but bitterness <laughs> is good. It adds, it adds color. It adds interest to the salad. And if it's not too much, and this is very, very and half a lemon per huge salad is not too much, then it really makes the salad interesting. But do remember, whenever you make fish, whenever you make sauces, even pasta sauces with lemon, always use the peel as well. It's very good. And it adds something. And this is something that's very important in Israeli food. You do want to see that yellow in, in your plate. And I love that, and that sunshine, like you said. I One of the things I fell in love with when I made Aliyah moved to Israel was preserved lemons. And then yes. I can't get enough of the pith and the, you know, rind and that tartness. And I, I eat it on its own. I put it in my sabir, in my hummus, in my, um, in my uh, falafel. I love, love, love. Do you ever make yes. those? Of course. It's This is North African by origin. And it's very easy. Once you get lemons, and it would be better to steal lemons from your neighbor's tree because then they're the best. <laughs> Uh, I think you're going to get us into a lot of trouble on this episode. No, I'm Gil. trying. I'm trying to convince <laughs> my Canadian friends that stolen fruit are the sweetest. But they say, no, no, in Canada, we don't steal. In Canada, we don't steal. So right. what can we do? But in Israel, we do. So once you get enough lemons, you just slice them and put them in layers. A layer of slices of lemon with the yes. peel, a layer of coarse salt, a layer of lemon, a layer of salt, a, a, again and again and again. And then on top, mm -hmm. just a tiny bit of olive oil, you seal it and wait for two weeks if you're patient enough. And then that's it. It's ready. It would be very soft, melting, and it adds sourness and bitterness to food, uh, which is wonderful. And We're the going texture to our of salad. the flesh, the texture of the yes, flesh. And yes, the yes, it uh, melts on yeah. your tongue. Yes, yes. So, okay, so how are we seasoning? Um, are we kosher salt, sea salt? What are you doing salt. here? I'm using kosher salt, but, uh, you know, whatever you like. And black pepper, not too much because you do you don't have the, the strongest sweetness. connection from Gil, but I see that. It, okay, salt and pepper, Gil, your connection is coming in and out. So okay. what kind of salt? It was kosher salt and black pepper. Okay, great. And then I wanted to show you this. This is my um, olive oil. And okay. I wanted to show you that it's really less than half a cup. It, that, this salad does not take a lot of oil. So, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I tend to over olive oil everything because I love it. So you're saying a little, be a little bit more reserved. Yeah. Yes. And the rule is whenever you're using olive oil, have the decency to pretend you're using Israeli olive oil. Because okay. everything is better with Israeli oil. But if you have Italian or Greek, it's okay. And okay. Mix. Okay. I love that this is such a huge, hearty bowl. How many people does this feed, Gil, <laughs> this salad in front of you? Look at what I found in my bowl. I found the, uh, this can feed at least, at least, at least a meal or like a table of 12 people. Easy. And also, it keeps very well in the fridge for 48 hours. So... Wow. Wow. It's stunning. It's stunning. It's stunning. I look like I, it's so vibrant and so textured that I actually feel like I can smell it and taste it all the way here. And I'm more like about an hour away from each other, but I feel like I can, you know, look the screen. Okay. There it is. This is my tabula salad. And, oh. um, and I wish it was mine. I wish it was mine right now. It is yours. I'm you. As I said, you you can either consume immediately or you can cover it with cling foil and keep it in the fridge up to 48 hours. It gets mushier, but, but mush is good. Yes, yeah, and mush is good. This is the part of the show, Gil. We have a little bit of a difficult connection, so I'm going to see if we our connection just behaves for us while we just get it to grab a drink and chat for a little. I feel like yes. I have 100 questions for you, so let me know what you're drinking. If you want to have a seat, and we can chit-chat, and we'll see. Maybe our connection will be a little bit better. Um, we were I'll, coming in and out. I'll pour Thank a drink, and I'll move, and we'll see okay. whether the connection will be better. Okay. 
that will be great. In the meantime, I'll just tell everyone what I'm drinking here. Uh, Gil spoke about lemon. Um, the second we all took our masks off here in Israel, you know, with the vaccination program, you know, being such a raging success, um, we all got sick. There's a crazy cold go literally going around the country. I kid you not. It like puts you down and out for a few days and then it, like lingers for like two weeks. So I've been literally nursing like mugs like this. this is like a beer mug that I've turned into my tea mug. Layers and layers and layers of ginger and fresh lemon um, with a little bit of honey. And sometimes I'll throw in a chamomile tea bag and sometimes I won't. And all day long, I'll just keep adding hot water to this, adding and adding and adding. And this has sort of gotten me through nursing me back to health. So um, it's just funny that Gil was talking a lot about lemons and lemon and ginger. So here, this is what I brought for my drink. Um, does the lemon affect my teeth? Gina is asking. So Gina, so interesting question that you asked. So I've gone through my life since I'm like 16 years old, I started bleaching my teeth. I think when I first got my braces off, I bleached my teeth. And then I went through, um, you know, every few years, maybe every 10 years, I would bleach them. And then a few years ago, when I started drinking lemon water, warm lemon water to start the day, it was good for the liver, for the digestive system, you know, everything I just I heard was a great thing for weight loss. Um, so you know, I try anything. So I started doing that. I started noticing my teeth getting really yellow. It was crazy. Um, so it didn't give me any sensitivity. It didn't, uh, and nothing else that I noticed other than it really yellowed my teeth. So that happened about a few, let's say five years ago. So then I did another teeth bleaching, like just a one session. And since then, um, I've been kind of careful to sometimes uh, not do hot water, but use warm water and sip it through a straw. Because um, I love my lemon water, uh, but I haven't been having it religiously in the morning, but now for the past two weeks, it hasn't affected my teeth at all. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, oh, am I going to have my guest back? Are we going to have a better connection? I hope so. I'm like so much I want to talk to Gil about, and I hope that it's just been, we can't catch a break here. He's like just such a great guest, and I feel like it's such a good show. He has so much to say. And Gil, what's going on with our connection? Uh, but can you hear me? I can hear you I can perfectly. He I can, but now I can't see you at all. Why? Because I can see both of us. That's so funny. Um, I'm asking you the know, producer to see. Um, maybe as men say, honey, it's not uh, me, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> correct, correct. Um, but except I think it's not me, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so touche to that. I like that. Um, but literally on camera here, everyone sees just a big black screen. Um, well, that's we'll not such a great look. You know, I'm not such a good looking guy. So. <laughs> First of all, we just got here your beautiful picture. Okay. And then, and then we got that image of you. So let's see if that works any better. I'm switching my AirPods. Okay. I hear you and I see you. Good. And you see what I'm okay. drinking? Well, now you're frozen, but tell me. <laughs> this is called lion's milk. Uh, oh. It's, uh, well, it's Arak. Arak is the local uh, spirit. It's uh, like Uzo. Uh, but Arak is transparent. But when you mix it with uh, ice and cold water, it gets murky. It's whitish. And this is why we call it lion's milk. And it gives you a lot of strength. Wow. I've been drinking Probably. lion's milk with my grandmother ever since I was five years old. Stop it. Stop it. Now, can you drive after you drink this? Like, how, how strong is what you got going on over there? <laughs> no, 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 no. I can. I, it's not recommended, but I, I, it doesn't affect me. I mean, it, it, it takes a lot of arak to affect me. I'm, I'm an old I would, lush. I would say if you've, been, if you've been training since you're five, I think you could probably you know, do, do some yes. damage over there. Arak with my grandmother and gin with my mother in the toilet, hiding away from my grandmother so she doesn't know that we drink. Stop it. I can't handle it. I love your life story and I love how colorful it is. I read that your mother and grandmother never divulge their age. People ask me all the time how old I are. I, I am and I say, the lady never tells her age. So I feel of like course. I would get along with them really well, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, my mother, first of all, she had a strange ho uh, hobby, which was to get married. So we know at least of three or four marriages that, we had, that she had. And wow. my father was the last one, and he was eight years her younger. So she no. tried to hide the fact that she was much older than he was. She was a raving beauty. She was amazingly beautiful. And we never celebrated birthdays at home because, you know, we didn't want to uh, embarrass her. 
So yeah, it was always a secret, but but yes, I was taught it, it's the most indecent and impolite question to ask a woman about her age. Good. Yes, the age and then the weight, both of those. Actually, there are three. I'm going to tell everyone here who's watching. Don't ask a woman her age. Don't ask how much she weighs. And don't assume she's pregnant. That's like yes. the worst. I just want to say, yeah. oh, the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, Gil, tell me about your memoir, Candies from Heaven, and the fact that it's been like translated to Chinese. Like, how did that come about? So, Candies from Heaven, here I have it here, is... Uh, I, I never wanted to be a writer. My my all my ancestors wanted me to to write a book about them. They said, "You inherited <laughs> the, the 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 talent from your grandfather. You should be a writer. You should write about us." And I never wanted to. I wanted to be a hotel manager. But eventually, oh. I said, "How do I get rid of them?" So I said, "I'll write such a nasty book that they will, you know, leave me alone." This audio, eventually. Yeah. <laughs> It became, it was a series, it's a, it's a trilogy, it's the Jerusalem trilogy, Candies from Heaven is the second, and I wrote all the nasty stories, and I even invented a few, but only a few, because my family is colorful enough, or, you know, you don't have to invent a lot. And first of all, they claim that they remember everything, even the things that I've invented. And so right. They, they, well, if you say they, it enough, it becomes truth, right? Like, it's like, oh, yeah, exactly. I can remember that. Yes, 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 it really happened. If it didn't, it could have happened. And they, secondly, they really fell in love with their, with their paper figures, and they claimed another book and another book, etc. And then it was translated to English. And then one day I find myself, you know, I travel the world and I lecture about my family, about Hebrew, about Israel. And I find myself in a book festival in Taiwan. And we really, really, really feared the translator. So you, you, you speak in English and there's a translator who translates to Chinese. Now, the translator, we called her the fortune will, uh, will of fortune girl. She was very cold, <laughs> very beautiful, knew some English, not a lot, but she was very opinionated. So I tell <laughs> the story of, of my mother and say, and then my mother uh, di divorced her, it, it didn't divorce her second anti French husband, but had an ongoing romance with my father for seven years. So the translator looks at me and says, why did she do it? And I oh my gosh. Her, no, I want to know why she did it. She was married. <laughs> so this was this was really difficult. This, yeah, here you can see the book in Chinese. It looks like yes. it's the cover of a toilet paper, doesn't it? Anyway, <laughs> um, and then, but I think that because of the relationship, the weird relationship with the translator, um, yeah. a, 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 a local publisher really, really thought that it would work. And it was translated from English to Chinese. I really don't know what's written there. It's not by the same by, by the same translation. We're not even right sure if it's your story at all, by the way. Exactly. We see on the right. cover, we see myself and my grandmother. The rest right. we don't know. And it turns yes. out that in Chinese there are it's a very different language. For instance, I didn't know that in Chinese there is a different word for an elder brother and the younger brother and the middle brother and an elder cousin and the younger cousin, etc. So who knows what they made of it? But uh, I hope it works. <laughs> I, the, 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 the feedback I get from, from Taiwan is that, that I like it. Well, th this is what we say. We just pray that it's a huge success there and that they brought justice to your words. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. And, and you know, for me, writing those three books, people tell me that the, the best compliment, compliment I can get is not that the writing is good or that, that it's a healing book and about caring for one another. And about the old Jerusalem of the 60s and 70s when we were all one tiny community. Yeah. And we, this is the first book of the of the series. Wow. And uh, wow. that's my grandmother killing a fish and me looking in horror <laughs> in the back my father and my mother are doing. Um, wow. But it's it's about really what 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 being a family is about. And many people tell me, you know, this is the book I took with my with, with me to hospital for operation. You know, this is what I wow. read when I was recovering from this. 
you know, this is what we read, God forbid, after this person died, that person died. You know, after when I had a broken heart, I read this because really the love that's in the book, not the love that, that I, uh, you know, put in the book, the love that my relatives had for this frail, short, not, 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 you know, the, the, the best genius or the biggest genius in the world kid that they yeah. all thought that was a bit, you know, maybe uh, behind. Uh -huh. But they, they gave me the feeling that I was their sunshine. They gave me the, the feeling that I was the best thing that ever happened to the world since Napoleon, my grandmother. I was <laughs> Napoleon. So, and well, and, I think, and yeah, I they were right. It. You are a sunshine. And I, I, I always marvel at how smart you are. And so it's so funny that you said a little behind. I can't even imagine that because the way that history um, rolls off your tongue and how much you know and your knowledge, that's so funny to hear that line from you. Thank you, but you should see my brother and then you'll fall for him. Tall oh. and handsome with gold curls. All the girls were always in love with him. Tell oh my gosh. First man. I, I mean, I'm, I'm married. I'm married, and he's tall and blonde too. So I think we're good. I mean, my family doesn't count, you know. You know. Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. So the connection is still a little spotty, but I, I can't. I will be. I would be remiss if I didn't ask one final question of you. The show is called Feed Your Soul. Um, we want to know if there's anything sort of soulful or spiritual to you about cooking. Um. Definitely. People always ask me, why do you cook? And I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I cook to remember. And I never cooked because I come, well, I come from a mixed family. But you, if you're just, you know, one, I don't know, one thousandth Sephardi, you always say that you're Sephardi. So I come from a <laughs> Sephardi family. And in Sephardi families, you don't let men into the kitchen. They bring only two things, dirt and bedlock. So no <laughs> men in the kitchen. My grandmother, we always had two maids and you know we I grew up in a in a comfortable situation but so but my grandmother was in charge of the kitchen although we had the maids but she never let me to the kitchen. The day she died when I was a soldier when I was 19 uh, I I got into the kitchen and started cooking just to remember her flavor. And there was this soup that we call butterfly soup. It's tomato soup with rice, but when you cook rice, it opens to the shape of the butterfly. Right. Rice. So yeah. there was this soup that she used to make, butterfly soup, and I wanted to remake it, and she, she, never, she didn't leave recipe behind her. And I was trying and trying and trying, and, I, and I'm not a chef, I never studied cookery, you know, a restaurant critic, but I never cooked in restaurants or in big kitchens. But, you know, I know my way around the kitchen. And it was, it was an okay soup, but it never was as good as her soup. And one day, suddenly I remembered that by the end of the process of cooking, she would grate two carrots into the soup to add some sweetness. So uh, I went to the kitchen and I made the soup and I added the carrots and I tasted it from the pot. And immediately tears fell into the pot because, you know, it was such wow. an immediate connection with my grandmother. So this is what's so full about food for me. It's the old hugs that we all miss. It's the, you know, it's the not, not very fashionable kisses that leave traces of lipstick on your cheeks. Yeah. And when you're a kid, you just do this, you know, when you get them. This is my mom talking about beautiful yeah. women. Yeah, and, and and but it's this, you know. I I I cook my grandmother's recipes, and I can smell the scent of of her perfume of four seven eleven. I can I can see her hugging me to her apron and shouting, "God, that he wasn't kind enough to me, and he didn't give me enough." But she will see to it and get everything in this world. And I, I can see her hiding away the food from me and saying, you know, your usually Jewish grandmothers should say, eat, eat, eat. No, she would say, stand in front of the food and she would say, you don't get anything to eat before you show me that you made sure that the maid 
had her dinner, before you made sure that the birds on the balcony got their breadcrumbs, only then you were entitled wow. to food. So all these lessons I've learned through food and I'm ever so thankful, you know, we're, we're big people, you know, important people. We travel the world. We see this, yeah. we see that. I'm on television. I'm on this. What does it matter? You know, if I could only for once in my life, hug my grandmother again, this would be the eternal price. Wow, Gail, uh, you brought me, you know, to tears. I'm getting teary just thinking about what you're saying. I think the tears dropping into your butterfly soup are probably the secret ingredients <laughs> of what makes it taste good and probably how she cooked with her heart and soul and tears. <laughs> and I, I think very much um, you've just hit the nail on the head on some of the things that we all search for. We yearn for that connection with one another. We all yearn for love. We spoke earlier, us all yearning for peace. Food is such a wonderful way to hug her when we can't hug her anymore because we know Definitely. that you know this life is not eternal so that to me is so special i thank you so much for sharing a piece of your heart and soul with us i apologize to the audience for any of the uh, poor connections but i hope that you're able to glean and to hear and to laugh and to cry with gil and i his memoir candies from heaven recently published in English and Chinese. Um, that's the second in a trilogy of three. They all look so amazing. They've got so many people through so many difficult times. The Tabuli Sal, if you're tuning in now, you must watch, uh, scroll back and watch how easy it is to make Gil, um, Gil's Tabuli Sal. The recipe will be below. Thank you, Gil, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take very, very, very good care. Shalom, shalom. Amen. You too. Shalom. Hi, guys. Hi there, in Renana. How are you? Um, I feel like I've been waiting so long to have Gil as a guest, and I was so looking forward to the conversation. I really could have gone on for hours. Um, thanks for your love from Indonesia, for Israel. Thank you. And I feel so, so, so terrible that it was such a poor connection. Um, if you can manage to scroll back and get through it, if you're just tuning in now, we made an amazing tabbouleh salad, and Gil actually spoke about the court case um, from Lebanon against Israel in The Hague regarding the um, origins and the national food of tabbouli salad and hummus um, and the court case was lost but he did make a very Israeli tabbouli salad which is very different than the Lebanese version so I think that you will enjoy it thank you Lydia so much I'm Israel Chai yes Gil and I thank you Gil and I came to you from Israel he was we're both in the center of the country he was in Tel Aviv I'm in the Jerusalem area and I spoke a little bit about you know the situation at the beginning of the show and so if anyone is tuning in now I'll just you know touch upon on it a little bit. Um, I don't personally like to, you know, get involved in politics. Um, I think I like to just speak about the situation as a mother. I think that I can very, hopefully very accurately represent <laughs> this group of people, this demographic of mothers who are yearning for streets that are safe for their children to walk down, who are yearning for peace. There's not just issues, of course, here on the border, but there are issues here domestically. Um, obviously, there's, we spoke with the torching of synagogues, places of worship, um, issues that are happening in my very own neighborhood, uh, violent crimes in, um, against women and children on the street, in the supermarket. Peace is something, one of those universal values that we all, all yearn for. And people are asking me, how are you staying? So um, uh, thank you so much for the beautiful love, Ben. Thank you uh, from Brazil. People are asking me, how are you staying calm? How are you not freaking out? How, I think this last 15 months has almost prepared us for anything. Between coronavirus and the whole world going through um, that, the trauma of what that was and what that meant. And then we had the terrible trauma I spoke about on the last show, the tragedy of the loss of life um, and in Mehron, in the north of Israel. And then now this week, the last two weeks, what's going on here in terms of the security situation and the conflict. Um, I, I Somehow I feel very calm and at peace and have a lot of faith and turning a lot to prayer. Prayer for me is uh, my comfort. Obviously, in the um, traditional Judaism, there's formal prayer. There's the morning, afternoon, and evening prayers. But having not grown up religious, um, it was very hard for me to get into this formal prayer cycle as I decided to live a more observant lifestyle. But what I was always very good at is crying out to God in my own words, with my own tears, even if people could hear me you know, in moments of stress. And I found it to be a tremendous um, just kind of relief 
uh, for me and a place to channel, channel, excuse me, any anxieties, fears, concerns, or worry. So that's what we're trying to do during these times and, um, and just stay smart and stay safe and pray for a resolution and for peace and um, for safety. And there's my mom there. So i am now, only now, can I officially end the show after my mama says hi, and I know that she's watching. And oh, by the way, in addition to prayer, I, something that I also always do is I cry. Meaning if I'm feeling stressed or if I'm feeling emotional in the moment, I will cry. I'm known as a little bit of a crybaby, but as my mom always told me, it's okay to cry. It's a good cry. You feel better after. So <laughs> prayer, uh, crying, whatever it is that can connect you to allow you to release the stress and anxiety of all that is going on and all the trauma that we're dealing with as a world, as a Jewish people here in Israel. It's It's been a lot. So those are some of my pointers and tips and just for you to get a kind of get a sense of what's happening here on the ground. Um, but Gil and I got through this episode, so the sirens did not interrupt us. Only the poor connection did. So um Maybe we'll do a redo or something when uh, we can all get back together in person one day because I feel like he's an excellent, fun guest with so much to talk about, so much history and so much of what we love about the show when we speak about sort of the intersection, the intersection of spirituality and food, uh, cooking and the soul and what it means to us in terms of our, our families in the world and how we can all come together around delicious food. So that's it for this very spotty episode with a terrible connection with the best guests of Feed Your Soul. Please always tell us what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like us to cook, who you'd like us to invite on the show. I'm Jamie Geller coming to you from Israel. This is Feed Your Soul brought to you by Aish. Thank you so much.